So I was in Spokane, Washington this past week. And, and you know, the weather in Spokane is a little different than the weather in San Diego, California. Um, although the weather in Spokane really wasn't that bad, as bad as it has been in times when I've been up there in December. But what I particularly noticed in Spokane this time was how late the sun rises and how early it sets. Um, you know, I, 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 it's bad enough in San Diego, right? Like, I'm an early morning guy, so I love the sun comes up around 6 or 6.15 or 6.30, whenever it is. But when it sets at 5 o'clock, it just seems like it's a little too early. Well, in Spokane, the sun comes up at like 7.30 or 7.40 in the morning, and it sets at 4 o'clock. And it's like just this kind of darkness settles in. And it was, it was reminding me um, of a trip that my daughter and I took several years ago, and we were driving uh, up to Spokane for her to go to Whitworth for her sophomore year. And it was the summer of 2017. It was actually August. And some of you may remember what happened in August of 2017. Most of you probably have no idea what happened in August 2017. But there was a moment like the 20th or 21st of August when there was a full solar eclipse in certain parts of the United States. Now, San Diego, I think, got a little bit of that. Well, I didn't really realize that. Um, so we were gonna be heading up to Spokane. We normally stop in like Bend, Oregon. And I couldn't find any hotels to make reservations in. And I was like, I mean, the only one I could find was like $700 a night. And I'm like, Morgan, I love you, but I'm not spending $700 a night to stop in a hotel somewhere. And I couldn't figure out like, why is everything so expensive or there's no room at all? And someone finally said, uh, you know, that's right where the solar eclipse in all of its totality is going to be seen, right? I was like, ooh. So, um, you know, we typically drive to my parents' house in Fresno, and then we would drive on the bend or somewhere like that. So there was nothing available, no room in the inn, so to speak, right? And so I made a reservation in Boise, Idaho, which is not quite on the way to Spokane, Washington. If you want to, I don't have a map to show that to you, but it's really not on the way. So, so we drive up to Boise, and it's the night before the, the solar eclipse is to happen. And Morgan and I are both kind of like, we just want to get to Spokane. Um, but we're like, well, you know, we'll get up in the morning. We'll see how we do. So we start driving for a couple of hours, and we get to a place called Baker City, Oregon. Not sure many of you have probably ever been there. We pull off to go to the bathroom, grab a snack. And, and I look, I, I, I Google, and I'm like, I know the solar eclipse is about to start. I wonder how much of the eclipse is going to happen in Baker City, Oregon, right? Or what? I think it's Oregon. I don't even know what state it's in. Isn't that terrible? I just know it's Baker City. Um, so anyway, so I'm like, I'm like Morgan, you know what? The, the, the full eclipse is going to happen right here. And I, of course, had already thought ahead of like, I'm going to get the solar glasses, right? And not the ones you buy at the gas station that blind you, but like legit solar glasses. So I actually had those as we, you know, as we were sitting there, I was like, well, let's just sit here and watch or stand here and watch. So we're literally at a gas station in Baker City, Oregon, watching this solar eclipse. And it was the strangest thing. Because some of you, I think some of you actually were, were watching it as well. And, and it's like, you know, the moon gets there and it just keeps covering and covering and covering. And then the birds all start singing like it's dusk. And all the lights, the city lights all came on like it's dusk. And then it goes totally dark and it gets cold. And it's like the darkness just settled in. And then the moon just keeps moving, right? And then all of a sudden, it starts to get light again. But there is, there was just this, I mean, it, it was kind of this awe-inspiring moment of watching this. And I also thought, I mean, I'm like, do you take a picture of it? Do you just enjoy it? Do you, you know, what do you do? And then I ended up messing the whole thing up and getting bad pictures and not probably fully enjoying it. Um, but it was just this sense of like, what did people think five or 600 years ago when this happened, two or 300 years ago? Like when darkness just settles. This morning, we're going to take a look and consider this idea of darkness and what God has done about it in the midst of that darkness. It reminds me of uh, C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, where he describes the land of Narnia before Aslan, the great lion, the great Messiah-like figure, begins to move. And he says, it was always winter but never Christmas. 
And it's that sense of just uncertainty and that sense of darkness um, that we want to take a look at this morning. So we're in the season of Advent. We're in the season of making our way to Christmas, reminding ourselves that Advent is not only about the first arrival of Jesus, but also the idea that Christ will return, that there will be this second Advent. We're basing our sermon series on the hymn, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. And there's four phrases in that hymn that I want to remind you of that we're going to be looking at over these four Sundays. So last Sunday, we started with Born to Set Thy People Free. This morning, we're looking at Born Thy People to Deliver, then Born a Child and Yet a King next Sunday, and then finally Born to Reign in Us Forever. This hymn that Charles Wesley wrote in the midst of looking at his own culture and his own society and seeing the depravity and brokenness and writing a poem or a prayer actually that eventually became this hymn. But I think there are words that are important for us as we think about what God has done for us in Jesus. And so our text this morning starts in Isaiah chapter eight, uh, verse 19. And I wanted to start here because typically when we read Isaiah chapter nine, we start with Isaiah chapter nine. Like we, we will, you will recognize those verses very clearly when I read them to you. But the context of Isaiah chapter eight is important. So this is about 700 years before Christ is born. There's a guy named Ahaz who is king and the Assyrians are on the move. So we read this, this is verse 19. When someone tells you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? Consult God's instruction and the testimony of warning. If anyone does not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. Distressed and hungry, they will roam through the land. When they are famished, they will become enraged and looking upward will curse their king and their God. Then they will look toward the earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom, and they will be thrust into utter darkness. What if I just stopped right there this morning? And that, that's, I mean, that's why this context is really important. So, I mean, you get the image of a broken, lost, wayward people. And then we get to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle, every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Things are looking bleak. Ahaz is the typical king of Israel, which means he's a bad king, right? That was a legacy of the kings of Israel. He is consulting the wrong people. He is making alliances with nations that God has told him not to align with. The people are no better. They're consulting spiritists. They're consulting the darkness. And the word of God comes to them and says, you need to be very careful. 
But we have to see that before we get to Isaiah chapter 9, the context of Isaiah chapter 8, the land of Naphtali, the land of Zebulun, which is talked about. Um, Those are the first two parts of the nation of Israel, the first two uh, regions that were deported by the Assyrians. But yet Isaiah says there is one who is coming who will push back the darkness. There is one who is coming who is going to bring hope. There is one who will bring honor to Galilee. Now let's face it. When we think about our own personal lives, we know what it is to be in darkness that is physical, but we also know what it is to try and navigate life when the darkness seems as though it just comes over us and washes over us in personal circumstances, in emotional circumstances, in in mental uh, situations. We know what it is to have this sense of darkness, to wonder how will we make a way. And it is in that moment that for the nation of Israel, as they are in the midst of the darkness and despair, that God speaks a word, that light will come. Isaiah 9 makes it very clear that light will push back the darkness. Now, some of you are perhaps doing what my wife and I are doing, which is getting out our Christmas decorations, right? Now, some of you who are hyper-organized and perhaps a little um, over the mark, like you're already done, right? Like, and praise God for those of you who, are, who have done that. I'm just schlepping boxes right now, okay? So like that, that's, that's part of my job, and my wife tells me where to put all the boxes. And, 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 and we have a lot of nativity scenes, right? And I suspect that many of you also have your, like your favorite nativity set or the oldest one you've got or kind of all of that sort of stuff. Now, now here's the problem with me being a pastor and the nativity set, I want to think about it theologically, because there is a person missing from the nativity. Okay, so you think, you're like, who is possibly missing from the nativity set? So you think about it, you got baby Jesus, right? You got Mary and Joseph. You've got the shepherds. You got every known kind of animal you could possibly imagine. But who's missing? There is someone kind of Darth Vader-esque who should be present near the manger. If the wise men are there, who else should be around? You're like, it kind of sounds like King Herod, but Paul, I'm a little scared to shout that out, right? Like, where's King Herod? And it's kind of always bothered me. I mean, I know none of you want King Herod like, like, like breathing over the manger scene, Right? Have I just destroyed this for you now? I apologize. <laughs> but it's like, like, I mean, the reason the wise men are at the manger scene is because of Herod. Because Herod wants to wipe out baby Jesus, right? And it's darkness and it's despair. And so I, 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 this is what goes through my mind, right? Why is there no King Herod at the nativity? And then yesterday it hit me as I was like thinking about using this as an illustration. And God's like, well, he's not there because the light has come into the world, right? There's no need for Herod to be at the manger scene because he has already been defeated. It's like, ooh, that's good. All right. So I'm not worried about King Herod not being in your nativity sets any longer, okay? But it's the, it's the telling of the story of saying, this is what God has done in Jesus Christ. That birth changes everything. The light pushes back the darkness, And when we read in the Gospel of John, so often there is this image of Jesus being the light. John 12, verses 35 and 36. Jesus is with those who are following him, with the crowd. He says this, Then Jesus told them, You are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. 
Believe in the light while you have the light so that you may become children of light. When he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. Jesus says, you only have the light a little while longer. It's the image of a person trying to get home or get to some place before the sun sets, and they have to wander around in the darkness trying to make their way home. John is very clear. John chapter 1, verse 5, we know this text well. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. The darkness is unable to overwhelm or overcome the light. And this is what Jesus does with the darkness. He pushes it back. But there's a warning. Like, if you listen to John chapter 12 very carefully, there is a warning. And if the warning's not enough, Jesus then plays a massive game of hide and seek, right? Because did you know, like that, that verse 36 is just weird. When he had finished speaking, he left and hid himself. Because he's showing them the light is soon to go away. And actually the rest of John chapter 12 is the last of Jesus' public ministry. John chapter 13, we move immediately to the upper room, Jesus washing the disciples' feet. but he's warning them and saying, the light will only be with you for so long. And what are you going to do? Will you walk in the light? Now, there's one thing that I wanna make sure that I think is perhaps I don't think it's the most important word. Well, maybe it is the most important word in the text I read to you earlier today. Because it is is the, the, the kind of pivot moment of what happens between Isaiah chapter eight and Isaiah chapter nine. And I kind of just read over it really quickly. So you all probably... You know, unless if you were paying attention to it. Um, Or if you looked at, like, Jim is doing a great job. Our online audience probably knows this. We send out this email every week that gives you all the scriptures. Like, if you want to know the playbook before you show up on Sunday morning, get our email. Because it will tell you every scripture and every quote that I am going to use. And that way you can come in and critique if I get it right or get it wrong. Because it has been known to happen that I will forget a quote at times or I will forget a scripture at times. So, but just a heads up, like, if you're like, hey, what is Paul preaching on? Um, you sign up for our e-blast, you'll get it, and you'll know exactly what it is that I'm gonna talk about. But here we are, Isaiah chapter nine, verse one. Okay, so Isaiah chapter eight, remember it's darkness, 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 gloom, gloom, gloom. And then this one word, nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. I want you to remember that word right there, nevertheless. Nevertheless, though you feel as though you are in darkness, though you feel as though you are in distress, though you feel as though you cannot see where you are going, though you feel as though you cannot make a way, Isaiah the prophet speaks the word of God that says, nevertheless, God sees you, God hears you, God knows you, and he will make the way. And then Isaiah goes on to talk about the Messiah who is to come. There's this great crescendo that happens. There will be joy instead of sorrow. There will be light instead of darkness. There will be peace instead of war. There will be justice. There will be righteousness. And a little child will lead them. All of this pointing to the Messiah who is to come. Nevertheless, Don't lose sight of the importance of that word in your life. We will have joy. Joy that is not, or joy, let me put it back this up. Joy is not dependent on our circumstances. Our happiness is, our sadness is, but joy is something that is deeper. 
I love how Carl, theologian Karl Barth puts it in his commentary on Philippians. This is what he writes. Joy is in Philippians is a defiant, nevertheless, that the Apostle Paul sets like a full stop against the Philippians' anxiety. Philippians chapter four, this gives you just a, a, a taste of this. And if you know the book of Philippians, Paul uses the word joy and rejoice time after time after time after time. But he's speaking to them in the midst of their uncertainty, in the midst of their anxiety, in the midst of their brokenness. He says, rejoice in the Lord always, verse four. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Karl Barth says this is God's defiant nevertheless. We all have anxiety. We all have uncertainty. We all sometimes feel as though we are living in the midst of a solar eclipse that is not passing quickly. And Paul says, even in the midst of that, you can rejoice because of what God has done in and through Jesus Christ. That joy is possible for us. That deliverance is possible for us. I want to make one more comment, though, on the light. Because the light is given to us, not just simply so that we can bask in it. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. Jesus challenges the disciples and those who are listening to the Sermon on the Mount. And he says this, you, now you need, you need to understand, having, having lived in Texas for 12 years, um, this literally is the word that you don't get to use all the time, but it is the most inclusive of words, which is all y'all, okay? So it's just not y'all. I, I really lost my Southern accent. I, I, I can't, I, it just sounds weird now to say that. Anyway, this is all y'all, okay? So this is like everybody, even though it says you and it's like you're thinking, oh, he's, he's pointing to me. He's saying to the whole crowd, this is for all of you. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. What a gift. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. You are not the source of the light but you reveal the light of Jesus to the world. This is our calling. This is our commission. We think about Matthew 28, the great commission to go and make disciples of all nations. But Jesus is giving the commission right here in, in, in kind of the beginning part of the Sermon on the Mount. He's saying, you are the light, you are the light of the world. I, I, and I don't make you the light of the world in order to cover you up. I mean, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. You don't light a candle and then put something over it. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. And I wanna encourage you with that because even as Jesus pushes back the darkness, there is this sense that you and I are called to do the same thing, that we are to let our lights shine bright. We're to let our lives shine bright. There is to be something winsome about the way in which we live, the way in which we talk, and the way in which we act. This is what we talk about when we say we want to not only experience the transforming love of Jesus, but we want to express it. And I want to go back, and we've looked at this before, but I always want to remind us of this, that when Jesus says for our light to shine before others in verse 16, he says that they may see your good deeds. There's two words for good in the Greek language. 
One is the word agathos, which is like someone who behaves well, like he's a good boy, she's a good girl, a a piece of pie, like it tastes good, right? But there's also the word kalos, and that describes a good that is more than just a piece of pie or a behavior. It describes a good that radiates beauty. It describes a good that is attractive. It describes a good that is winsome. And so when Jesus says, let your good works be seen, he is saying that the person who is filled with the Spirit lives a life that reveals those good works that reveals something about the radiant beauty of Jesus Christ. And the question I want to have, the question I have for you today is this. What good work that will radiate God's beauty that will show forth the winsomeness of Jesus Christ. What good work is God calling you to do during this Advent season? Who is God calling you to come alongside? Who is God calling you to have a conversation with? Who has God been nudging you to show forth the light of Jesus to? I cannot answer that question for you. But I would love for you to think about that, particularly as we come to the Lord's table in just a moment. Where can I show forth the good work that God has done in me to my society, to my culture, to my world? Where might I reflect God's light? And as we come to this table, I want to remind us of one more thing. Sometimes we feel as though we're not worthy. Sometimes we feel as though we've been wandering around the darkness for far too long. Sometimes we wonder, can God really love me? And I want to remind you of the words of Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1. That one word, nevertheless. No matter what you have done, nevertheless, God loves you. No matter what it is that you want, as you do the accounting of your life, and you feel as though perhaps you are not worthy of God's love, nevertheless, know this, he loves you. He sent his son for you. He has pushed back the darkness for you. He turns your mourning into dancing. He turns your sorrow into joy. He says, you are my beloved. I have sent the light into the world to show that to you and to remind you of that. And I want us never to forget that. This table reminds us of that that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. Pray with me, please. Oh Lord, we come to this table. And as we gather around this table, we remember Jesus taking his disciples to the upper room. And in beginning, how he began to unpack what it was that was going to happen. And Lord, we live in this strange tension, particularly on a day like today when we look to the advent and the birth of Jesus, but Lord, we also remember the death of Jesus and we recall what all of that has meant for us, the promise of everlasting and abundant life. So God, forgive us for what we have done wrong. Cleanse us of our sinfulness and brokenness. God, remind us of the defiant nevertheless that you speak over us. That nevertheless that speaks of your love 
your grace, your mercy. Lord, allow that to fill us. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.